A very good evening to you and welcome to this second segment where we discuss our topic of discussion uh, at the Health Digest that ran at 9 p.m. And today we are discussing painless delivery. What options are there for women to deliver painlessly and still deliver safe babies? And with me tonight I have uh, Professor Zipora Ngumi. So, professor is an uh, anesthesiologist for the past 36 years. She is a professor of anesthesiology with the University of Nairobi for 30 years now. She's a trainer in both anesthesia and critical care. She has been the Dean School of Medicine at the University of Nairobi and also the Chair of the Department of Surgery and the first chairperson of the Department of Anesthesia. And also Dr. Stephen Okello. Dr. Okello is a consultant anesthesiologist for the past 10 years. He is a lecturer at the Maseno School of Medicine. Uh, he is a fellow of the College of Anesthesiologists of East, Central and Southern Africa and also the current secretary of the Kenya Society of anesthesiologist and before we even talk of um, of the painless delivery professor today we woke up to the incident at Lokichoge where students were attacked some died and some were critically injured and one of the places where the Red Cross uh, uh, paramedics or the first responders were taking them was to an ICU critical care and this is straight at your uh, your purview or your remit what, 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 what does critical care, uh, what, what is it about critical care? Because people just know somebody's in ICU. What happens there once somebody's brought to the ICU now, like those students? Um, the critical care unit is that place in the hospital where very ill patients are attended to, and particularly to support the vital organs like breathing and uh, blood circulation when they cannot maintain it on their own in the general ward is to keep people alive who would not live otherwise. Mm -hmm. And in that unit you have um, specialized nurses and uh, physicians to look after them. Life support machines are used in that area and that is why they go there. Mm -hmm. And for that you need, a patient needs a nurse throughout the 24 hours stay. So for that patient to be well looked after, you will have three nurses in 24 hours. That is a very expensive place. Mm -hmm. And also you have life support machines, you have doctors, you have physiotherapists, you have laboratory technicians, x-ray radio radiographers, mm. surgeons, mm. other physicians, everybody is there. Mm. Now, the uh, um, incident brought otherwise healthy people who had gunshot wounds, which meant they might have bled. And there again, you have to replace what was lost, either with blood itself. So you need a blood bank close by to get the blood while you do the other support for the vital organs. Mm -hmm. So it is a very important place, and you have to be trained to do that. And uh, um, anesthesiologists are trained both to look after patients having surgery and also to to receive critical care. Mm -hmm. Yes. So now we know when this current administration came in, they said they are providing ICUs to almost all, uh, actually 90, 98 uh, county referral hospitals or several referral hospitals in the counties. And you have mentioned a list of very many specialists and requirements for this. So do we have the capacity now, like taking an example of the case in Lokichogyo, do we have the capacity to handle what happened in Lokichogyo at that remote place? Uh, I don't know what uh, facilities they have in Lokichogyo, but they do have some ICU support in that place because they did take some patients there. Uh, when this new government came in, they said they would prepare 11 new ICUs to support what existed in the past. Uh, we, we had um, in the public hospitals 
ICUs in the provincial hospitals before the counties came to be. So these 11 that were promised and are running, one of the handicaps they had was lack of uh, personnel. Equipment was provided, but without the personnel and the requisite nurses, like I said earlier, you need labor-intensive nursing for those patients. Uh, it was a bit difficult. So uh, at the moment, we make do with what we have because we do have a referral service mm -hmm. to take patients to the nearest critical care unit. Mm -hmm. So we are managing a bit, okay. but we need to do better than we are doing at the moment. Okay. Uh, Dr. Okello, your comment on the Lokichogyo incident and the need for critical care support for those that were injured. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Masi. Now, we do appreciate the efforts that the government has made so far in terms of provision of uh, the equipment. And we know that uh, across the country, there's been a rush to put up uh, ICUs. But by definition, in addition to what Professor said, it's not just the building and the equipment. There's a lot that goes as far as human resources is concerned. And when you look at trauma cases, like what has happened in Lokichogyo, time is of essence. So these are kind of patients that you need to get to the, this critical care setup very quickly, and the treatment initiated almost immediately. Actually, we would prefer that this treatment to be started on site, at the site where the injuries have occurred. Because by the time some of these patients get to us, maybe the referral, I think they are being taken to Eldoret, that is hundreds of kilometers away. We've lost so much time. And with every minute that passes, the chances of a, a complete recovery, or what we want to call the prognosis, gets worse by the second. So uh, as far as uh, the equipment is concerned, we are very grateful. And uh, we are continuing to engage with the government, both at the national and county levels, to see if we can train enough personnel to be able to use the equipment that they have provided. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, we'll end up with a situation where the equipment will be stored there, probably mm. disused for an, a couple of years, maybe decades. Mm. Yep. OK. And now, coming now to the topic of the day, which was uh, epidural anesthesia and epidural uh, analgesia for normal uh, delivery. You're one of the anesthesiologists, Dr. Okello, who actually administer this. Mm -hmm. How common or how accessible is epidural analgesia for delivery for the women in Kenya? As it stands now, the access is still limited. And again, it goes back to what we keep talking about, human resource. If you look at the number of the people who are trained to administer this safely, it's very few. The whole country, the number of anesthesiologists is short of 160. And of this, close to 80% of them, 77% to be precise, are in Nairobi. It means the rest of the country has the remaining 30% to share. Actually, 23% 20, to share. Mm -hmm. 23, 33 yes. of the 47 counties do not have a single physician anesthesiologist in this country as we speak today. So it means we might talk of 160 in the country, but 33 of the 47 counties do not have the anesthesiologist who are trained to administer this in a safe manner and it has to be accessible and affordable. So it's something that we are working on. You will get the service in Nairobi, the big cities where we have anesthesiologists. You will get this in Mombasa, you will get this in Eldoret, Kisumu, probably Nakuru as well is coming online. But the rest of the country, it means that the patients will have to travel to where the skill is. And we hope that then in the, in the near future, we'll be able to disseminate this skill to, to the rest of the country. Uh, Prof, we have 478 clinical officer anesthetists, 104 nurse anesthetists. Can they administer epidural anesthesia for delivery? Well, they could administer that. But again, uh, the support they need for that service to, learn, uh, to run safely and to monitor safely means they stop doing all the other surgical needs that patients may have. But they are trained to give um, safe anesthesia for the most common 
uh, operations that are done in this country, like for cesarean section and general surgical uh, procedures, uh, they can give. They do give spinal anesthesia and mm -hmm. epidural they could give. They are trained to do those things, but to practice is another story because as you know, we have about, we have trained about um, it's more than 3,000 clinic officers to give anesthesia at the KMTC since they started training them. Mm -hmm. But most of them have, do not practice. Mm -hmm. Reasons being that they are posted to areas where they are, you are either the single one or there are two of you. One is working, covering emergencies. The other one is doing the elective lists. And you can't run without rest. And uh, the Ministry of Health is uh, working hard to make sure that we have at least three uh, anesthesia providers in each of the hospitals, 300 facilities that we have this surgery is going on. So um, it is not easy to do that because they need day offs, nights offs, to be able to concentrate. Uh, to practice anesthesia and critical care medicine, you have to concentrate. It's labor intensive for the practitioner. And you cannot work around the clock without breaks. So uh, the KMTCs continue to train. At the same time, I think human resource, human resource, human resource is what we need in our health facilities. And uh, I, uh, the, the government is doing what it can. But I believe we need mm -hmm. to employ more of these people. OK. And uh, Dr. Okello, one of the when preparing this discussion, one of the biggest fears among many ladies is that uh, when the epidural is administered, then there's a risk that they'll be paralyzed or they'll have backaches, continuous chronic backaches. What are the fears that women should, or what are the effects that women should know? And are there any ways to be safe when having this epidural anesthesia done? Well, nothing is without risk. Uh, it's possible what you're saying. Uh, they could have some headache. A small percentage of patients may actually experience these headaches. And uh, we are trained. I cannot get into the details of what exactly we do, but we're able to prevent this, or at worst, should they occur, that we are able to manage them. Uh, one of the biggest fear and being peddled by many people around is the issue of the backache, that many patients tend to blame on either the epidural or for those who undergo what we call spinal anesthesia, that's some injection in your back. They tend to associate this back pain with this injection. But we do know now that any woman who goes through labor and delivery is just as likely to have the back pain, whether they had it normally under cesarean section or with the epidural. Therefore, the epidural or the, or the spinal is not the cause of the backache. So in this is just a matter of uh, us giving out the information, and this is something we sit with our patients and explain to them. Uh, the other risks, they're minor, but what I could tell you, Masi, is that you are more likely to have an accident on the Kenyan road than to have any complication with the, what, what we call anesthesia. That's how safe it is. Mm -hmm. It's risky, yes, but I'd rather you get this epidural done than you being on a border border and trying to rush across top. Okay, so Prof, what other options then apart from the epidural injection, which many women fear, what other options are there for a painless normal delivery? Because what we have gathered so far is that very many women fear the pain of labor and actually some opt for a cesarean delivery just to avoid the pain. So are there other options apart from the epidural? Uh, there are other options apart from the epidural. There are the tablets that you get to relieve the pain, uh, painkillers. Mm -hmm. There is that one. There is also uh, um, training the mothers how to behave when the pain starts. Uh, 
taking deep breaths to make it ease the process while it lasts. Because the, the, the labor pain takes short spells. It is not very prolonged. It comes and goes, comes and goes, comes and goes. And in the meantime, the baby is make, making its way out. Uh, there is that, mm -hmm. besides the epidural. Mm -hmm. And also there is breathing, uh, a mixture of oxygen and nitrous oxide, which will not put you to sleep, but we, has pain in leaving nitrous oxide, 50%. Mm. If you breathe that one, the pain will go. Mm. Uh, epidurals, I think it's a very, very small percentage of uh, uh, our mothers in this country who will, have, who will ever have an epidural. But with that one, the, the inhalational method, again, you will have to have, be in a place where you will have that given you in a controlled fashion because you need 50% nitrous oxide mixed in oxygen. Mm -hmm. Again, the mother is taught how to breathe it, and you only breathe it in when the contraction is coming. Before it starts, the mothers know it is starting, and you take before it starts, and while it is peaking, you have inhaled enough. Mm -hmm. It is in and out, in and out. And mm -hmm. as I said, you won't sleep, but the pain mm -hmm. will go. OK. And uh, one, one of the fears about having <coughs> a medicated uh, uh, normal delivery per se, or even during the cesarean, is that these drugs that the mothers are being given, whether inhaled or injected on the back or during general anesthesia and they are put to sleep completely, may have some effect on the baby. Do they have any effect on the baby? Uh, any, any? I, I don't think uh, uh, there is no significant effect on the baby with an epidural and with the inhalation of agents. Mm -hmm. Some of the tablets, like narcotic drugs, a little bit may go to the baby, but normally uh, very little is given during labor mm -hmm. to warrant worry about it getting across to the baby. Okay. Very little. Okay. Uh, Dr. Okello, your comment on that, and also that many obstetricians uh, fear that this assisting to reduce the pain during delivery actually prolongs labor and increases the rate of cesarean sections? Well, their fear is justified because I think uh, uh, we haven't had a lot of experience in this country. But from where this uh, procedure is done a lot of times, like if you go to the West, 60% of the women there deliver under epidural. And it has been shown that it might prolong by a few minutes I mean, if your labor, instead of delivering at 12 o'clock, you delivered at 12.05, so what? But you have a, a number of hours without pain. So the second stage, what we call the second stage of labor, might actually be prolonged, but by a few minutes. It's not significant. So if you are willing to delay the birth of your child by a few minutes and get the past seven, eight hours of pain-free, then it's something that is worth considering. As far as effect on the baby is concerned, uh, for the epidural, it's completely safe. It does not interact with the baby at all because of the way the drug is delivered. And by the very nature of it, it is not the drug cannot go across the placenta. When God was creating the baby and the mother, he put a barrier between them. And the drugs from the mother is not very easy for some of them to get into the baby. And we choose these drugs which have that capacity of not crossing to harm the baby. So pain management in whatever its form, is generally safe for the baby and the mother. And we usually try to tailor, because no two patients are the same. So you tailor your drugs or your intervention to the particular patient that you have before you. So I will not say that whatever works for you will work for her, for him. We are all different. OK. So, Prof, mm -hmm. uh, about 80 to 90 percent of, of some institutions in America actually report that mothers deliver via epidural or assisted via epidural. You have been in practice for the last more than 30 years. Why are we still not there? Um, we are still not there because we don't have the re human resource to do this. Uh, we uh, have two. Uh, training institutions that train physicians 
anesthesiologist in this country, the Aga Khan Hospital, which is a younger institution and trains very few uh, physician anesthesiologists per year, two to three per year. I think they are going on to four, and they have been at that for about 10 years. Uh, the University of Nairobi has been training since 1979, and we have trained about 150 total. And some, uh, most of them, of the ones we train are our own national ones. We train also a few from outside the country. And uh, also there is, uh, um, you know, the, some of the graduates don't work here. They work outside. They look for greener pastures. So that is the reason, because we cannot uh, manage to have physician anesthetists in all the hospitals, like uh, um, Dr. Okero said earlier. Mm -hmm. The majority of them are in the cities, mm -hmm. and the counties have uh, very, very few there. So what we are doing now, we are scaling up the training programs, and the Ministry of Health is very keen in training more and more anesthesiologists. In the University of Nairobi, we want to be having an intake of about 15 per year. In fact, currently we are having a total of about 36 uh, uh, residents mm -hmm. uh, on the training program within the four training years. Mm -hmm. Again, the training of physician anesthesiologists also is long time. Remember, you train them from having finished uh, the undergraduate program to become a physician and then doing internship uh, and working maybe for about a year or so mm. as medical officers mm. okay. and, and then they come in for four years. Okay. It is quite a long time. Okay. So that is the reason. It's the, the time it takes and the numbers we have to train and the mm. fact that we have only tra two training institutions. Okay. Uh, Dr. Okello, your final comments just briefly. Uh, I just want to put this into perspective to you and to the country as a whole. As, as we go into what we are calling the universal health coverage, and we are talking about Vision 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, for a long time the role of anesthesia has not been recognized. We have trained so many surgeons, we have equipped our theatres, our ICUs, but these people without the support of the anesthesiologists, who currently we can also call the perioperative physicians, are not going to be able to do much. Right now, as you're speaking, uh, we only have three anesthesiologists for a million Kenyans. That is how dire it is. Mm -hmm. The WHO recommended would be five per 100,000 population. But I'm telling you, we only have three per million, not per 100,000. So we still have a long way to go. And from the economic perspective, the World Bank analysis has shown that if you invested just one dollar in training anesthesiologists or anesthesia providers, the effect on the economy is tenfold. That is going to be at around $10 getting back to you. As we speak now, just, just, just one, one more thing. The number of people who are dying every year because they don't have access to safe, affordable anesthesia mm -hmm. is about 17 million every year worldwide. Mm -hmm. If you consider the number of people dying from HIV, TB, and malaria combined, this is still four times that number. So it okay. means lack of anesthesia mm. is killing four mm. times the number of people dying from malaria, mm. HIV, and tuberculosis combined. So as a country, I think we need to rethink our strategy mm. as far as healthcare is concerned and delivery of uh, uh, safe Thank surgery Thank to you. our people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, we have been speaking to Professor Zipora Ngumi. Professor Ngumi is a professor of anesthesiology at the University of Nairobi, and Dr. Stephen Okello is a consultant anesthesiologist and a lecturer at the Maseno University School of Medicine. And we have been discussing anesthesia, critical care, and uh, methods of painless normal delivery. Uh, until next week, same time, when we have a different topic, a different panel, uh, enjoy the rest of your viewing. I'm Dr. Masi Korir. Have a good evening.